if we in Europe would do, as an example, two things, make it criminal to throw food away, <laughs> like the French model, perfect, because then less than, uh, around 50% of what we produce goes into the, into the bin, into rubbish. Yeah, because either the currents are not beautiful enough <laughs> or we mismanage the logistics. So if we make it criminal to throw it away, there's no shortage of food supply. It's a question of management or appreciating carrots which have small issues which you might have to cut off. So there's no shortage of food, number one. Number two, if we as society change the way how we look at children and the upbringing of children. So what we have right now is what I call the civil war at home. Yeah, we know like in Luxembourg, 90% of marriages end up in divorce. They have enough money to pay family lawyers. So we know that when, when we know romantic relationships are not always working a lifetime and that's okay. What we as society do right now, we then celebrate people who create a war at home. Yeah, so custody battles, access to children, parental alienation, etc., etc. So this is a reason why the guys we meet at, at the Kairos Summit, so H Farm, why they have one or two burnouts in their early 20s, because they grew up in a civil war at home. Yeah. yeah. So if we stop that, if we have the food situation making it criminal, second, a society say, you know what, if you don't provide equal access to the child to both parents, then you are actually wrong. We don't want to know the rest. Yeah. If there is no, if there's no uh, security or safety issue, then children should have equal rights to be with both sides of the family. If we establish that as a status quo, things will change in no time. Andreas Will Gerdes is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Andreas is an entrepreneur, world citizen, and a passionate father. Andreas sold his first business at age 20, working out of a garage. He then successfully built what will become part of Orange PLC. Andreas has been at the forefront of the mobile telecoms revolution, empowering lives for over 25 years. From the 2017 Malta Innovation Summit, where we actually met, there is many wonderful things that he talked about there and engaged with other social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that are solving global grand challenges. Andreas is a Malta-based German entrepreneur who brought ideas for the recovery and progress to Croatia and connected with Croatian entrepreneurs and activists. Andreas is interested in bringing progress to this country as well as ideas and innovative solutions that are simple and scalable. He feels it is utmost importance to boost health and our immune systems he believes in Croatia's unique potential, living and healthy and happy lifestyle first and foremost. Finally, Andreas envisions mothers as the agents of change in the healthy food revolution. Despite evolving gender roles, mothers play a fundamental role in raising children and mother and child both benefit by fewer illnesses and less visits to the doctor. Andreas and I know each other from a couple different areas, uh, not only the Malta Innovation Summit, but also Kairos Society as uh, fellows, as well as um, H Farm. We, we've been on different workshops and seen each other there as well. And we both sit on the Manabu board as uh, advisors and, and uh, initial evangelists promoting uh, the empowerment of women and girls, and especially the education and knowledge of children around the Sustainable Development Goals. Andreas, welcome to the show. So good to have you. Good to be here. How have you been? Reconnecting with my home in Malta and uh, enjoying the, the kickoff of the autumn time, which is the most lovely part of the year. I love autumn and winter in, in North Africa, so it's, it's beautiful. So enjoy the combination of sun and sea. And uh, as long as our fiber optic cables work, it's a great place to be. So we already did this recording um, before. We did it when you were still in Croatia uh, uh, at a beautiful hotel. But on my end, I must apologize. The, the audio for some reason did not work. 
and we cannot hear you as well, although the background and location is wonderful. But that leads nicely into uh, kind of where we're going as you're, uh, you, and you were in Berlin a few weeks ago, and uh, you're kind of this global citizen and you're Malta, Germany, um, Croatia, and uh, you're traveling around, moving around a lot. You know, I've seen you in Italy and different places. Um, has any of your numerous experience of the past helped you weather this pandemic or this lockdown time better? Yes. How? Um, I was born close to the Dutch border on the German side. So one of my very early childhood experiences was to cross the border from a place called Münster, where I grew up, and go to the Dutch side. And I realized how different things are within a 40 minutes uh, travel. So no curtains, you can look in the buildings, more colors, more diverse. The farmer's market feels and smells different. So that or something which uh, I was curious about to learn why it's different, what can I pick up from it? And that kind of uh, has been with me all my life. When I see now how we lock down borders, how we try to make this experience, uh, make it a national issue, uh, we can realize how irrelevant that is. The virus doesn't have a passport. It doesn't care about Schengen or not Schengen. It doesn't care about immigration. It does not. And uh, ever since I picked the home base in Malta, we have thousands of birds visiting us every spring and every autumn. And they join the pool, <laughs> they have a good time, and they don't have any paperwork. They have no proof of any vaccination. They are just happily commuting between Africa and Northern Europe. So it is something where I realize our current way, how we manage different countries, is a very male way of doing it. And kind of we protect our borders and uh, i can only recommend for everybody to watch the last thousand years of european borders so it's something which you find on facebook and online you find a video which shows you the last thousand years of european borders and they have been moving all the time what they did not put into the video yet is whenever it moved how many people had to die for it <laughs> yeah? so if the people in charge would have been women who have would have given birth to all the people who were killed to move borders slightly to the left slightly to the right with no real impact in the long run, you would have realized how irrelevant it is. And the pandemic is a beautiful reminder that anything which we try to address from a vertical perspective on a, on a nationalistic basis is, is, is dysfunctional. It doesn't work. You, know, you cannot export rubbish because it stays with the same Mother Earth. So if you chop Mother Earth's toes off, she will still die even though her head is in perfect shape. Yeah, so <laughs> it doesn't really work. Whatever you touch has an impact. So that really opens up a, a lot of different rabbit holes. I'd like to try to go down a, a few of them mm -hmm. with you. And do you have really um, an overarching uh, philosophy or vision of, of how our, our, our world should work as far as, uh, I heard some of it co coming out in, in how you were describing this, you know, uh, there are no borders, you know, on how they've moved and, and, and how the pandemic is, is truly a global citizen as well as uh, you and I speak about food and different things as well, how mm -hmm. food is also a global citizen. It's not bound by borders or, or nations. Um, is there a philosophy or a vision or a goal that you're working towards uh, something, whether it's global citizenry or kind of a symbiotic earth or or the evolution of Homo sapiens to more a Homo symbiose? I think the, the, sim the simple answer to this is uh, collaboration. Yeah, and so uh, the only person you should compete with is yourself. So if you compete with being a better version of yourself every morning you wake up and uh, reflect on what the day before was before you move your legs out of the bed, uh, that's helpful. But otherwise, accepting that we are great the way how we are and that we don't have to compete with anybody and not compare ourselves with anybody, uh, that would make a huge difference and take, take the motivation out of a very male-driven way how we operate governments, uh, which is on the compete level and which is limited in the most cases to the next border. Yeah, so the only person who I 
realized was different on that issue uh, was a guy whom I met when I was probably 95, uh, called Helmut Kohl. And I asked him at the time, I said, why are you so passionate about the European Union? And uh, he said, young man, um, we stopped killing each other. He said, before, every 50, every 70 years, we killed each other on a kind of an industrial level. <laughs> yeah, so millions had to die. And he said, that is stopping. So that was kind of the essence of his answer. He didn't come across to me as an um, intellectual, strategic brain, but as a very grounded person with a, with a mission. And that mission is actually an excellent mission. And if I hear people asking me questions like, do you believe Europe will survive? <laughs> if you look back at the last 10,000 years, it has never been as peaceful, as collaborative as it is right now. And um, we have a tendency of looking at negative use, which is not stimulating for me. Um, but if you look at the things that like what Helmut Kohl achieved, he not only achieved that we now have another, ever since he told me this, 25 years of uh, collaboration and peacefulness. He even mentored somebody like Angela Merkel, who in her existence and humbleness and, and humility, does a pretty good job and, and uh, continuing the uh, collaboration path on a European level. It's great to see. It is beautiful to see. So I'm, I'm also a big proponent that uh, there is no such thing as neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, fierce competition, you know, uh, the natural selection, um, you know, uh, those things absolutely do not exist. Uh, those are, 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 are um, competitive corporate uh, philosophies that got pulled into Darwinism and in and, and, and many respects that we have to compete with each other. And actually what I mentioned with, with this homo symbiose comes from a symbiotic earth and um, and really, we've long found out, well over um, three, four, five decades ago, that it just does not exist, not only in a mathematical science way, but everything in our world works in harmony with uh, collaboration and cooperation with another. So I love the term that you're using with this, um, and, and in alignment with you of hoping that the, the world will make this transition to, to a symbiotic earth or this true uh, collaboration that we not only can go further, but we're all distant cousins. So why are we dividing ourselves from each other? Why are we competing against each other instead of building us up? And, and uh, uh, I've seen a bunch of videos online uh, um, during this pandemic a lot where now some sports and some events have started to go uh, come up again where there's been some competition uh, in sporting, but where at the last minute before the finish line, somebody trips or, or uh, gets off path. And the person who was in second place stops and helps that person get back across the finish line say, no, you know, that was an honest mistake or an error or, or something that uh, happened and he would truly or she truly deserve that first position. So I love to see that. And I know our world func functions much better when we move in that direction. My question is though, was there something with your mother with a, a female influence in your life that kind of has pulled out in you some experiences that you say, Let's empower women and girls. Let's, if we can have a more balanced uh, 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 female influence or uh, the, 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 the goddess or the patriarchal uh, 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 female figure in our world, that it'll, it'll actually, it'll, we will all do much better. Uh, is there some influences in your life that have led to that? I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, with hindsight, with hindsight, uh, yes, I'm sure my mother had a strong influence on that. Um, and, and they sent me to a girls' school. So my secondary school was a girls' school um, where we had 1,000 girls and we were the first eight boys at that school. Wow. And that stayed, so gradually we were grade five and up to 13. 
uh, they only allowed the whatever they, they only added every year new fifth graders. So there was a significant quantity of women, and um, that largely created a different operating system. And so uh, I believe we should start from a perspective we don't have to empower women because they are empowered. We just have to remind them. I have always I enjoy that dialogue with women rights organizations and to remind them they might want to change their name. As long as they claim that there is a need for women rights organizations that automatically suggest there's an inferiority because that's why they need them. It's, it's the wrong way around. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have, they have, they have the power, they can, they, have, they can withstand more pain as we all know and they have the gift of creating life and we can support it. This is how we have been designed as human beings. Um, operating from a level of, of perceived inferiority doesn't really help. They are the ones who still as a majority have the strongest influence when it comes to the operating system of children. So if we have today men who, as an example, pay in companies lower salaries to women than to men, they were all raised by a mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my recommendation when I read those things, I always tell them, why do we talk to their mother? Something must have gone wrong. If he was brought up in the way that he shouldn't wash the floor, then maybe his mother should remind him. Yeah, so the women who complain about it and then fight against men and say, let's unite against men, you know, it doesn't help anybody. <laughs> it just creates a separation. Yeah, uh, raising, raising children in a positive manner uh, without preconceived uh, ideas of what, who should do what. Yes, yeah, so my oldest boys know very well how to do the laundry, how to do the ironing, etc., etc. Yes, I went to girls' school. I learned knitting and I learned all this stuff. I had a good time doing it. Yeah, and they were not beating each other up on the, in the courtyard during breaks all the time. So there was a different energy. Correct. It was more collaborative. Correct. And I think that's for me natural. Yeah. So I, when I was asked to run super fast. Otherwise, I wouldn't get a medal. I said, you know what, the other guys were half my size. Why should I physically be able to run faster on short distance than this guy? It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and I always had to struggle that I, if it doesn't make sense, I would happily accept the teacher to give me whatever grade, but I would not uh, follow his direction. So but this is what led me to leave school early. Um, yeah, there was a strong influence. and. Um, but I think we all have it. It's, it's again, it comes back to the mothers. If the mothers allow uh, boys to be boys in an open, in an open source model, <laughs> that's great. If they tell them you shouldn't do this because your sister should do it, then we create the next generation of, of challenges. Yeah, right now we only have we only have women shelters. Yeah, for domestic violence. If you really check the facts and look at countries like Canada and they have thousands of cases, they realize that 70% of the domestic violence cases are actually women. Yeah, we, we as society don't see it. I experience those things myself. Go to a police station and say, by the way, she hit you with a pan, they laugh. Yeah, in yeah. enough jurisdictions. So, yeah, yeah. and this has to change. And the, the core again for changing this, allowing both genders to grow up in a, in a happy and healthy childhood is to remove the limitations yeah, and allow them to be human beings, not predetermined by pink and blue or by certain behavioral patterns, which just creates a problem for the next generation. Exactly. That, that's really where, where we're going as well as we want to set up the future generations with yeah. uh, positive, desirable futures mm -hmm. and not something that they're already, already behind the game, be already behind... Uh, and, and their progress and evolution because they're still trying to fix things that, that maybe we've put into place or stigmatisms or, or other borders or restrictions uh, for, for their positive future. Um, that, that, I mean, I, I think we've gone down enough rabbit holes on that, but it, it's beautiful to see that uh, your way of thinking and how how that do you have a, a set uh, kind of a mantra or an idea of some specific things that uh, our generation could do 
to influence, evangelize, or take some actions to, to set up that, that next generation or the, the future to, to usher that in. There's some things that we need to do or maybe not do to make sure that that gets into place. Yes, I, I had the pleasure of working on that together with Tiana on this Manabu movement. Uh -huh. And the core thing is to talk with children, not to children. You had to accept them as equal human beings. Yeah, and to not because they, they are born with ideas, they are born with with creativity, and it's not up to us to tell them what is right and wrong. It is up to us to provide an environment which is safe, that's correct. But otherwise, talk with them is the core, listen to them is the most important part. And this is not happening. In the most cases, it's it's if if kids address Others, let's say adults or parents, it's we are busy, we are busy, we are busy. So that's one thing. And, and uh, it is good to always, when they talk to you, say, give me a minute, or give me five minutes, but then actually stick to it. Yeah. And when I talk to them, I normally go on the floor and knee because they're not on the same height, height, height level. Yeah. Uh, just imagine somebody more than double your height and you look up to that. It's, it's not too much fun. So <laughs> talking with them means either going down or sitting next to them, but you're on an eye-to-eye eye -eye level and then listen, take them seriously. They come up with stuff which is amazing. Yeah, Ken Robinson, who recently died, uh, he brought up in, in many of his uh, beautiful pieces of documentation and videos that pre-kindergarten kiddos are tested when it comes to divergent thinking on a, on a genius level. And this continuously goes down with what we call formal education. Yeah, and so let's embrace what they have and talk with them and listen to them. This is going to make the difference. This is why the Manabu movement is focused on following their ideas. And if they have an idea, support it and allow them to implement it and back them up. But let them do it. <laughs> kids, kids who at age five, six, seven realize that they can, they will be unstoppable. I, yeah, they, will, they are ready to challenge all of what we believe are current problems with great solutions, which many of them we haven't even thought about. Uh, for agriculture, for nature, I really like biomimicry uh, a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, there is a, a human mimicry. Our offspring and other children um, uh, mimic a lot what they see in the adults and, and what's yep. presented in front of them, whether it's on television or media or their surrounding f family influence. And so I, I really that that it's a different form of mirroring as well that can can strongly influence uh, children's uh, so that uh, the the a nice household a, a um, some something someone that listens and sets good examples I think is is vital. I'm I'm a grandpa. I, I will have my fourth grandchild on uh, hopefully October fourteenth. My my son's daughter and I have four adult children. And uh, uh, you, you also have children and things. And so we, we've kind of been around the block on seeing on children and families and, and uh, there's no manual that comes with them. You know, I was looking around, what, where, where did the manual pop out when my children were bored and, and it wasn't there. And the only thing I had to reflect back on to is my mother and my father. And, the examples and the experiences they give me, and thank God they were wonderful. They were positive ex uh, examples and made me who I am, but also gave me the insight on how I can maybe try to do better with with my but, but children. Why, do, why don't we have that? So why don't we have basic driver's licenses for parenthood? Why don't we include in those not only first aid? Yeah, so if they choke, they actually don't have to die. Yeah, why don't we include in those the importance of immune system boosting effects. Why do we include in those basics? Because in certain jurisdictions where I travel to or where I spend a few months, they have a tendency of giving antibiotics to kids all the time instead of allowing them to have a fever for four days. Yeah, so having a fever for three or four days, yes, it takes a parental effort, but it boosts the immune system in the long run. What in some jurisdictions they do because probably somebody who imports antibiotics loves that business model. <laughs> and most people prescribe antibiotics all the time. And so if, you, if, if we would say, if you drive a car, you need a driver's license. If you want to have a weapon, you need a license. 
and many things we already have that established. But for something which is as important as the future of the planet, we have zero basic mandatory features. And there shouldn't be somebody who is around a child 24 to 7 who doesn't have first aid training. I see countries where kiddos choke and die, totally unnecessary, because nobody bothered to train them and they didn't realize it might be important. So we as society totally fail that. Uh, and is it, and then more, more, more important is even how to make sure the immune system of a kiddo stays on a 10 out of 10 level. This is what came up with this pandemic right now. People yeah. ask those questions and they told people, stay in the house, or stay in the house, and stay in the house. For me, that doesn't make sense. I understand social distancing, cool, but I took the kids two hours per day into nature, six out of seven days, and I would not do anything different. I would rather change the location where I am. For them to be around the trees, <laughs> yeah, uh, enjoy the rain or whatever it is, but, but get a feeling and the connection to nature, I think is important for the immune system. Yeah, so this is something where the basics, like a, like a parental driver's license should be the minimum requirement we do as society, because Mark, we have right now, as you know, uh, a level of teenagers where two thirds identify with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. We have a suicide rate of teenagers, which was never higher as it is right now. Or if we go to a Kairos summit, the fact of 20 year olds who talk about their second, second burnout is high. Yes, <laughs> yeah? absolutely. So, and that is, that is all related to the limited or to the upside potential which parents have if we would provide them with some basic, which we don't. I think you, you touched upon it uh, properly. I'm, I, I may be divided whether, whether we need a driver's license. I, I, have, I, I have a friend, he, uh, uh, the, a good friend from the Philippines. I go to the Philippines a, a lot and have done some trainings and, and talks there, worked with uh, some indigenous people in the Philippines. And he, um, he has eight children. Uh, uh, him and his wife have eight children, but he actually should have had uh, 12 children, um, but some of them died because, uh, uh, not because there was no driver's license, but because he's impoverished. He is uh, so poor that um, his only joy and hope is, is a family. And he knows, and going into it, him and his wife, that some might not make it. And um, so they continue to have it, have children, and and uh, that's part of the life. But it goes back to this maybe driver's license concept of, of parenting. Um, it, it's the basic rights, basic inalienable universal rights of human beings that aren't being covered or met. We're not having basic resources, basic infrastructure, basic food, basic education and knowledge and awareness so that we can sustain ourselves replicably as human beings. And if we had those basics met, I think that would be the most, in my opinion, the most ideal driver's license for life that any of us could get so that we, we weren't panicked or in fear or worrying about or competing about the basics of life just to, just to get from one day to the other. Uh, instead, we could be creative and get educated and, and thrive with flat families and flourish and, and go beyond our health and infrastructural needs um, to much greater things uh, of reaching those desirable futures. And, and uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the true driver's license. Instead of universal basic income, I would like to see us all receive a, a global, universal, inalienable hectare for everyone that's replicable, that they each get, and, and that we're all stewardships over that. And as, as we have children, and the, as they come into this world, we pass that stewardship that we, we, they don't inherit it because they get their own, but we pass that stewardship and how to make it work and how to make it thrive and in, in abundance onto them, which is the learning manual, the, the knowledge of this symbiotic earth, which we touched upon as well, this and this connection with nature, because you're, you're so right, the, the biome of our gut and our body and our health is 
integrally uh, tied to the biome of our earth, which we're polluting and harming in, in many different ways. And those two things, if they're not in alignment, then that's when we get pandemics and viruses and many, many other problems in our world. You mentioned Ken Robinson. Uh, he, he passed away 21st of August, I believe it was, day before Earth Overshoot Day. He was uh, um, not only a mentor, but I had a podcast with uh, Graham uh, Brown Martin, who wrote this book, Learning Reimagined. And Ken Robinson is, is in this book. And we, ha we actually had a long talk about him uh, on the podcast as well, um, because it was, I think it was only a couple of days after he'd passed away. And um, they'd collaborated and worked on some things, but I find it unique that you, that you bring him up because a lot of that ties to education and the imagining, reimagining learning, you know, that, that they both discussed and they worked on that really where we've been educating our, our children uh, for so many centuries in the absolute wrong way. We're setting them up to be slaves and laborers and, and not creative and uh, very restrictive. And so I, I know you have some thoughts and philosophies as well, as you mentioned with Manabu. I'd like to hear your thoughts and feelings on, on, on education and learning and what you know, you, you mentioned nature. Is there some things that you could depart with us on, 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 in that direction? Sure. Um, I was introduced to him in the context of a guy called Edward de Bono, who's still alive. And Edward is a neighbor of mine in Malta. So when I bought this house here in 95, I learned that Edward de Bono is on the other side of town. So we can see each other from the roof. And um, he introduced me to Richard Worman, the guy who started TED at the time and took and brought me to New York for one of those events. And uh, this is how I got plugged into it. What I realized is that uh, what we are now familiar with, what we're now familiar with through the generation of smartphones that every few weeks pops up and says, you need an update, software. What I realized very early on that people in the early 20s, when they finish their studies, get their master's, maybe a PhD, that they believe that they know what is needed to be known. My education, my personal education has been and still is very different because I love to learn all the time. What I realized, what we, we have software and software updates. What we are not consciously aware of, then we have headware, but lots of people forget the source code and don't understand how to update it. And so if we bring to the awareness of the people, the, not only the importance to press the yes software update on your phone, but accept the fact that, that, they, that to realize that they don't know what is needed for the next update and they accept to look for it, that would be already a major game changer. Yeah? And, and what we introduced 200 years ago probably is, is the idea of offices. Yeah. Uh, if you look back to the Roman times, they were operating mobile. <laughs> they had their little stone plates and were taking notes. The idea of sitting in an office during the golden hours of a day, yeah, between whatever, eight or nine and five, <laughs> was a pretty uh, unhuman feature of the industrialization. Yeah, but if you look at the existence of mankind, we have for the longest time not done that. We came up with the concept of spending the golden hours of the day in an office, um, in the last 200 years. And now, through what I believe in empowering people, uh, they can use their intrinsic mobility and the combination of visualization to work from anywhere. And that is a big feature right now. And this, again, is thanks to the pandemic. And so uh, people are realizing that they pick up new ways of operating, which I believe will be, if we look back in 10 years, positive effect of COVID-19 is the fact that people consciously realize they have a source code <laughs> and there's, no, there's a hope for an update. In any case, they can imagine it exists. I'm not saying they accept it. For a lot of people to realize, uh, to realize that we, with this, we should know that we don't know and we keep learning is not something which goes well with people who have been going through an ongoing uh, extended conventional education because they believe they know more than others do because they went to the full university, they did another master's and they did another this. And so they believe they know. And um, I always operated in areas where things change all the time. So 
and I don't believe in the status quo. Um, yeah, and it's there. Uh, that's how I operate. That's that's fabulous. It's uh, really crazy because today we just uh, released another podcast. We release on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it was with Christian uh, or Hans Christian Boos, or Chris Boos. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he's on the digital. Uh, um, uh, Council for the federal uh, government of Germany mm -hmm. was appointed by Angelica uh, Angela Merkel, and um, we spoke about AI. And we, we last saw each other this year in DLD in uh, Munich. And I asked him, sort of almost similar to what you were just say, saying about this operating system and the update. I said, "How you know? Wouldn't it be nice?" to have a real time update of collective intelligence. There's yeah, obviously misinformation and fake mm -hmm. news and information overload uh, out there, but a lot of us are missing just this, this update of, of things that we would probably would empower us or help us in yeah. one way or the other if we ha had the knowledge that it even existed or, or what was transpiring in other places in the world or even in our close proximity. And I said, you know, how can we hope for that with AI in the future? And he said, we, we don't want that. We want, you know, uh, free will, freedom uh, uh, of that. But, but then we, we, we digressed a little bit and he said, you know, we should kind of, it would be nice to have something like that that was also on the level. And then uh, it, it, you still had the free will to, to decide or listen or to, to choose to accept that into your operating system, but that it was out there. Because today there's just so uh, much confusion and misinformation and information overload of things that do, do nothing to better our future, or more to dumb us down. And the, the real vital information that would, would help us progress as, as humanity is missing for a lot of us and and we're getting stuck on in many different ways you know the 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 covid the pandemic is is you know is the first wave but there's actually three other waves behind it um that are coming uh not only climate change but the biggest is probably the biodiversity loss that we're having that uh, is having a, a tsunami effect on on our world and so it's interesting that you, 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 you see it in that same respect and that you're talking about there. I, I want to put your feet to the fire. What, what, uh, what's your take on how we're going to get that update? Uh, is it AI? Is it something more uh, with, with what you mentioned, the connection to nature is, gives you that automatic uh, update of operating system that puts you in your place or, or is it something else? I believe it's already happening, <clears throat> it's my view. So if I look at how many people right now, the whole discussion of vac vaccines and non-vaccines, the fact that the mass media comes up with information about vaccines being finished and uh, prepared in three to six to nine months. If you look at AIDS and other issues which we have or cancer, we haven't managed to come up with vaccines in the last 30 years. <laughs> and now, now people start asking questions. So tell me, so we haven't managed this one, but this is ready in six months and I'm supposed to take it for sure and even though the virus is mutating and changing all the time. So people ask themselves questions which didn't happen before. Yeah, look at what happened with our current Pope of the Catholic Church. Three weeks ago, he went out and said, by the way, the rainbow movement is actually a positive feature and God loves all of us. Yeah, he's embracing people as we are. For thousands of years, we have been fighting that. Yeah, I arrived in Malta early enough, pre-fiber optics, yeah, so you had copper lines, which were actually shitty. So uh, I was part of connecting it to fiber optics. I was part of Malta when it was hardcore Roman Catholic. So the same Malta today is number one globally as a rainbow index country. Wow. It is number one in Europe for the safety of women. Wow. It is number one for GDP growth in Europe for the last whatever five years. So something is working. So look at it, for, go back now 20 years, hardcore Catholic, the rainbow was kind of not heard of. We fly a rainbow flag on our building since a few years, and it's, it's becoming a movement. And now the Pope, 
two weeks ago, I believe, Deutsche Telekom changed their logo to rainbow colored. Wow, for my birthday, kind of, it's the same day. So it's nice to see, it is nice to see. So I see things changing. This is the way I look at it. And so don't forget, places like Lidl, as an example, they uh, address an issue which is uh, food expiring by making it cheaper. You know, they say 30% off because your yogurt officially expires in three days. We all know it's good for another 10 days and you can buy 30% cheaper. If we in Europe would do, as an example, two things, make it criminal to throw food away, <laughs> like the French model, perfect, because then less than, uh, around 50% of what we produce goes into the, into the bin, into rubbish. Yeah, because either the currents are not beautiful enough <laughs> or we mismanage the logistics. So if we make it criminal to throw it away, there's no shortage of food supply. It's a question of management or appreciating carrots which have small issues which you might have to cut off. So there's no shortage of food, number one. Number two, if we as society change the way how we look at children and the upbringing of children. So what we have right now is what I call the civil war at home. Yeah, we know like in Luxembourg, 90% of marriages end up in divorce. They have enough money to pay family lawyers. So we know that when, when we know romantic relationships are not always working a lifetime and that's okay. What we as society do right now, we then celebrate people who create a war at home. Yeah, so custody battles, access to children, parental alienation, et cetera, et cetera. So this, there's a reason why the guys we meet at, at the Cairo summits or H farm, why they have one or two burnouts in their early twenties, because they grew up in a civil war at home. Yeah. Yeah? So if we stop that, if we have the food situation making it criminal, second, a society say, you know what, if you don't provide equal access to the child to both parents, then you are actually wrong. We don't want to know the rest. Yeah? If there is no, if there's no uh, security or safety issue, then children should have equal rights to be with both sides of the family. If we establish that as a status quo, things will change in no time. Uh, Those are two things totally in alignment with you. So um, I used to be a priest, a uh, religious priest, and uh, I'm not religious anymore. And I don't belong to any faith. But I think the things that the, um, the Pope did, I don't, if, you, if you ever watch a, I believe it's a Netflix movie, The Two Popes. If you watch that, that's fabulous. A little bit of history and insight to, to how things evolve. But he is the most progressive Pope we've ever seen. Absolutely fabulous. He's a, a people's Pope and uh, he wrote the encyclical, which is all about um, our planet and, and our environment and how we have a deep stewardship for it and the things that we can do. And, and the things that have come from him have just been absolutely amazing that a leader um, who has so many people around him is so progressive about the the burning topics of our world. And the reason why that's important is because if uh, I believe religion is mythology, if mythologies don't evolve, they eventually die out. So all mythologies, all Greeks, Romans, uh, 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 on and on, they die out. We see their ruins if they don't evolve, if they don't evolve, especially with the world. And, and there's so many Catholics and people who are religious around the world, if they don't keep up to time where, where our world's growing, then some problems will occur. And so I love the fact that the Pope is, however his divine inspiration goes, that he's seeing that he's disseminating that information and he's also evolving with the world so that we can, <clears throat> because we need that unification. I mean, that's such a powerhouse that we unify and see ourselves as part of this symbiotic earth. There's something you touched upon earlier with, with children and, and Monabu that, that I, uh, I, I maybe want to make a statement about or, or have you go into more depth as well. I believe that a lot of the answers to our problems in our world, we already have. They're, they're within us. And if we, through our parents, or us as children, as uh, our children, uh, when they re reach, I guess, a level of consciousness or when they ask those questions, those very hard questions, they can be existential or earth shattering sometimes. But if we ask those questions 
back to ourselves or if a parent mirrors those questions back to us and we actually have to think about them and 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 go into is that true and just by almost uh, re-mimicking that question back to somebody after they've given or the answer that they've just given you back to them makes them think even more can that be right is that true and i i believe the majority of the answers because we're deeply connected to this earth are already in us and, and they just need to be asked. And, and a lot of times with and I kind of uh, trying to tie these together, not only religions, but uh, direct marketing or snowball systems uh, and network marketing. The reasons why they're so successful is because you're born into them or your mother, your father, your cousin, your neighbor is already amongst those religions or network marketing or those organizations that are really large. And so you say, no, I think they asked all the questions. They know that it's right. They know that that's the plan and the direction that we need to go. And so I'm not going to ask them myself. And then we get to a point in our life where all of a sudden we're like, no, the, there's something wrong. And then this is existential problem comes to, to us, but also where we are trying to do this rite of passage where we're confused. And even as adults, this level has moved up significantly where we're like, you know, 40 years old, some of us now, and, and still don't know the meaning of life or where we're going and don't have a goal. That's kind of a scary deal because we haven't asked the hard questions and it's a lot of work. Um, so I don't know if there's a true question or any thoughts in there for you to jump on, but um, the, w when you were talking about the children and kind of working through that um, driver's license or that education with them, how that can evolve. Open source. Yeah, open source. If you look at, if you look at the religion model, uh, my mother was a nun. She was put into a, a nunnery by her family and she resigned from it. I think four years before I was born. And uh, so we have, a, we have a tendency always to put things, or we baptize children at a day and age where they are not involved in that decision. Yeah, which is, I believe, wrong. So we should expose them to different belief systems, but we shouldn't say, by the way, you have to use Apple only for the rest of your life. And we determine this at age three weeks old. Yeah, so you get an Apple ID, it's tattooed on your forehead. Yeah, and don't ever change it. So. I have this discussion with my sons when they come up with which phone right now, why is this, why is that? And they look at it from different angles. And so it's nice to see that you have teenagers who look at the Apple philosophy, they look at the Google model, they look at, at open source models, and they realize their differences and the differences exist for a reason and they empower different people for different aspects. So, and this is what I love about uh, the Malta example coming from a Roman Catholic background before it has been for over 200 years a Muslim country. If you go to a Maltese Roman Catholic church in Maltese, they call God Allah. So probably the only Roman Catholic church where you can go and they pray loud to Allah. Yeah, which I always, I like that. This for me is a little bit charming. Yeah, and uh, I, I grew up as an altar boy, um, believing that uh, Jesus was born as a baby with curly blonde hair and blue eyes. If we start, and the, the Pope might do it at a certain point, will actually bring to people's attention that nobody, nobody in the Bible is actually white. Impossible. So if you, if you think that's true, then the whole immigration issue, and we will love people from Syria, we would, we would celebrate them because you know what, who knows who the next is from an enlightened perspective, etc. So, but we have not, we're not teaching that. If people would realize that nobody in the Bible is actually white, the, the decorations they put up for Christmas with baby Jesus having white, white skin, blue eyes, and blonde curly hair, as if he would come from Copenhagen, uh, it, it's not actually, it, it's, 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 it's misleading, purposely misleading, which is wrong. Yeah, so we, like the Pope now in the recent weeks celebrating the rainbow factor, I'm sure it will come up. And then we will embrace the diversity. And that's the powerful feature. Yeah, so as I said, you can see as an example like Malta, uh, you can make it, again, more multinational. You can boost the economy. You can boost the safety for women yeah, and for everybody who 
is lives a rainbow related lifestyle. It can be beautiful. And my kids, including a seven year old, celebrates a rainbow without thinking through that it has anything to do with potential sexual perspective. She just celebrates a rainbow. And this is how we should do because we, we as human beings take photos of rainbows all the time. Yeah. yeah, so that's what it should be. And the rest, it's important to live a happy and healthy life, boost your immune systems. And you said, yes, there are 40 year olds who have not asked themselves some hard questions, but you know what? Our formal education system is avoiding any hard question. They don't even explain you how to calculate a loan. They don't even explain how to check, uh, how to check a jurisdiction. I have this with digital normats who ask me questions. And I, and I tell them, by the way, did you look into the legal framework? And they, if, if they didn't study law by coincidence, they, they wouldn't, that question doesn't cross their mind. Yeah, so basics of being successful are not taught to keep people depending. Yeah, so and this is the wrong way around. I love empowered people. And this is why Manago is cool. A whole bunch of the Kairos concepts and ideas of the original founders from Kairos in the US are really cool. Yeah, so there, there are great things which we can support. And as I said, making food, waste of wastage of food, throwing food away criminal is powerful because we realize we already have enough. <laughs> People always tell me there's not enough food on the planet. I said, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. We spend so many EU subsidies for people destroying food <laughs> to balance market prices. Just make it criminal. They will find a way to give it to people. And we don't have those food issues. And Lidl is a good example. They were, from my knowledge, the first ones who said, your yogurt or whatever it is, 30% less. Cool. And there are some people who only buy those because they know they're still good for a week and they eat it in any case. They don't buy it to store it. So the solutions are there and so you have to implement it. France is also a great country, especially around Paris. It ha had a lot of law yes. uh, laws and implementations. Uh, Carrefour is a big uh, progressive uh, grocery mm -hmm. store chain has done some positive things. So I'd love to see that as well. You, you, you've you almost answered this already. It's um, really now we're almost halfway into it or more. Uh, the first question, do you feel like a global citizen and what are your views if maybe in the future we we break down these walls, borders, and divisions of humanity. How 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 would you answer that question? And what are your thoughts and feelings about it? I think we're all born as global citizens. We're all born as citizens and and kids of Mother Earth. Yeah, and you're not born as the as a son of Mother Earth, only allocated to her elbow or only allocated to her ear. You're not. <laughs> yeah, whoever said this is the following territory, and you're only supposed to be here because these guys are bad because they have a different flag and you know what? It doesn't make sense. Look at, look at the majority or look at the animals, what they do, the birds who commute. Yeah, try to, to, to establish any Schengen rules for dolphins. They laugh about it. It does not function. It's a conceived issue because of fear to, man to, to manage borders. So this is an identity which we are educated with. <clears throat> and as I said, luckily, I'm the youngest of many kids and I had more or less attention, so I had more freedom. And I was close to the Dutch border, and this was exciting. And then I did projects here yeah, in Hong Kong. I was two years in Indonesia, and I learned a lot. I looked at people, what are they doing differently? So what, is, what, is, what can I pick up from it? Yeah, and why do we have now a place like Bali being so compelling for an international community? Yeah, without any specific rules or regulations, just because the way how it is, how people operate and uh, how people treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis. So answer, I think we're all born as citizens of Mother Earth, everything else educated. And you can see this, this, this whole border issues, you have this, even in a, in a small town, which is our home here in Malta, they have a difference between the people who are living up in the town which is 500 meters up and down because up are the farmers originally, down with the fishermen. <laughs> so, yeah, so if you marry a farmer's daughter and you are from a fisherman family, that was an issue 30 years ago. <laughs> now they have rainbow flags across the country and it's a little different. Yeah, but the kids work remotely on laptops with clients and projects all over the world. Wow, so this, is, this makes the issue of nationalities irrelevant and Skype started with it because you didn't have any more international access codes. 
Yeah, because I remember the, when I learned there's a plus four nine for Germany. Wow, that's interesting. And then there's so many other codes. How do I ever remember those? Now nobody asks for that stuff anymore because Skype started, Facebook followed, Google did it. So you, you call a name or a photo so much more human. Yeah, so when our kids do it, they just look at photos and then they press the photo and then boof, the person pops up and they don't ask the question of where is he or she, which country, which jurisdiction, irrelevant. And this is thanks to, to some people who believe in the European Union that we have right now a prototype of a model, the most successful on the planet so far, where it works reasonably well. And I can tell you that I learned from my experience now in the Balkan area, there are first cities where the mayor puts everything online. So every money he spends for the city is online. So he makes it super transparent and people love it. And now I learned that the prime minister in Croatia who was recently reelected, he said, I want every city in the country to follow that model. So, but this eliminates corruption. This makes sure things are transparent. People know their rights. Yeah, so that is what I call integrity, openness, and transparency. This is what I call IoT. So it's, it's the equivalent or it's an alternative to the Internet of Things. It's really IoT for integrity, openness, and transparency. And I saw that two mayors were elected in Romania, a country which was known as being super corrupt. There's now a German guy who became the mayor of Timisoara, I think it's called. It's a city in Romania on Sunday. So it's possible. People with a message of transparency and openness and get elected in countries which have a history which was really difficult. So they go, they go from really difficult to fully digitalized and transparent. That's powerful. That's a European model. A German, German citizen who now lives in Romania becomes a mayor based on an entire town being excited about this new age of transparency. And that's powerful. And the kids love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's fabulous, and I'm seeing that more and more around the world, different places emerging and becoming more open and transparent. Would you um, please tell us a little bit more about your journey in the last uh, few months of the pandemic? You and your family have been on uh, Croatian and television a few times, so the, the, uh, your kids have been on TV for uh, Manabu and you've been on, on TV regarding some agriculture and eating things, uh, dealing with pesticides. Can you tell us a little bit about those things that you're working on and that you've been uh, addressed in the news with and, and uh, yep, sure. what, what are you evangelizing? I have, I, I, have a, yeah. I have a history of going to places and seeing things which people probably don't see who live there all the time. It's a beautiful feature of, of uh, not being a tourist, but spending, let's say, two months or three months in a place, which allows me to get a feeling for it. Um, it always takes me around a week to actually energetically arrive. Yeah, so even if I jump on a plane somewhere, I don't feel I'm there yet. So it takes me a few days, sometimes a week to do that. So in Croatia, I, I came to Croatia first in October 2017 because of an abduction case of my second daughter that actually started my uh, interest in the Balkan area. And so then I was asked by people because of this abduction case, the media started interviewing me and so I told them what I think. And um, I don't make a secret out of what pops up in my head. I don't consider it as my ideas. I just consider it uh, whatever the universe puts into my head or into my heart at that point in time. So, and so uh, I saw Croatia, the country, which reminded me a lot of Berlin after the wall came down. A lot of the architecture is very similar. Uh, beautiful people from a DNA perspective. And uh, you know, Deutsche Telekom bought the, uh, owns the majority of the state telecom companies. So their fiber optics and the infrastructure works perfect. You can walk through a place like Zagreb and you have WhatsApp video calls with no interruptions. It's wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty unheard of. And I said, wow, if you have that place, you could do actually magic with it. Yeah, right now, Malta is the number one country in Europe when it comes to brain drain. So from the people who grow up, they, they want to leave. In Malta, we managed to change that by a lot of people coming. Interesting people coming and celebrating the climate, celebrating the mindset, etc. cetera. Croatia has, is number two, with lots of people leaving. So far, people are only coming for tourism. Nobody stays. 
And so I said, you know, if you want to change that, come up with a model where people are in, excited to spend three months, six months, nine months in the country. So the communication started, I was interviewed by the media. To make the long story short, I had then people reaching out to me, like Tiana and others, and I developed relationships. And I love to mentor people because for me, it's, it's something which is great for my intellectual and, and mind-stretching experiences. And I love to contribute and, and take certain things from A to Z and, and allow them to think in slightly different terms. This is what I've been doing. And that triggered projects. Uh, and I've been on a, invited to talk, or I've been asked questions on a regular basis. Yes, and we were on TV because I was, when during the pandemic, uh, they were in the town and they, it was still legal to walk outside, go grocery shopping. So I took my son on my shoulders and my daughter next to me and we walked grocery shopping and the TV stations asked us why we do this. And I said, if we get some food, number one, but number two, actually we walk always through the park, we go to the forest for the immune system. And then they ask questions. <laughs> then I was interviewed and I said, I believe number one thing you should do is boost your immune system because immune systems have been dealing with viruses for the last millions of years, yeah? If you, if you weaken the muscle of your immune system, it doesn't work. So I said, immunity wellness should be a core issue. And you have a country which has ample space, which is unused, and the climate is perfect compared to Malta, it's dry, like a desert in summer, but Croatia, even in summer, it's green, has amazing space. Logistically, you can just put on a truck, drive it to Frankfurt. It's kind of an ideal setup to grow something else. And I said, you know what? You have Deutsche Telekom digital lines. You're part of Schengen. You have space to grow stuff. People can work remotely, make it something to focus on. Focus people to boost their immunity, spend three weeks or three months in a healthy environment with toxic free food yeah? and with functioning fiber optics. And that led to saying, yes, that makes sense. So that's, that's a short version. And uh, I'm sure they, they enjoy this on, on their Good Morning Croatia program um, because it seems to be simple. And whenever it's simple and, and uh, scalable, it it's, uh, actually uh, gains momentum. And this is the same thing. Uh, Tiana sent me a message last weekend and said, Andres, I got messages from, from Croatia. People are copying the, Mana, the Manabu movement. And so we both came to the conclusion that the best thing which can happen, that people are not only talking about it, but they creating uh, copycat versions, which is perfect. Yeah, every local kindergarten should have their own brand, yeah, under their own logo, and so they don't have to say inspired by Manabu. That's it's not important. It's important is to have ten more children feeling great about themselves, and that they can trigger change. And, and your kids were also on on TV for cleaning up yeah. trash and uh, cigarette butts and plastics in yeah. the park, and that was beautiful as well. Nice to see, and I, I think there was a lot of momentum around that, examples that, that we've seen all over, and it, it's always nice to see you guys on, online, and especially social media. Now my I first- up, I, up, I got messages from Belgrade and from Bucharest, from homeschooling parents, who are now all on this kind of school lockdown model, and they said that uh, the pigs themselves the kids themselves pick the subject of street cleaning. Street cleaning is popular. Yeah, I remember when I was really young, it was always said, if, you, if you're not successful in life, you have to, street, you have to clean streets. So when these people who are doing homeschooling, the kids themselves pick the activity of half an hour, 45 minutes, clean the street, going around, and they celebrate it because they feel that they make a difference. They talk to adults, don't throw the stuff around. And so parents, posted it from Bucharest and from Belgrade in the last 10 days. So it's, it's, nice. it's, it's, it's unstoppable because the kids love it too. That's beautiful. Uh, it's a yeah. lot of fun and it rallies a nice momentum. Yes. I, want, I want to get to my first and mm, hardest question for you probably that I have today. And that is the, the burning question, uh, WTF. And as you know, it's not the swear word. It's what's the future? And I'd, I'd like to get your perspective. I don't want you to necessarily tell us what the governance or, or governments or others need to do, but what's, what's your vision of getting you and your family to a future? What does that look like? The happiest moment which I heard people had was when they were actually considered as uh, dead, but were brought back to life. 
So I had uh, some experience with talking to people. I read about this in the media as well. So people who actually already were considered as medically dead and were brought back to life through medical intervention said they saw so much white light and they felt for the first time in their life to be actually perfect the way they are. So, so they felt so good about it that they were unhappy to wake up. So what I'm trying to say is we will look back probably in 10 years to this pandemic experience as a, as a booster of positive awareness of being great the way we are. So, and that is what I believe makes all the difference. So if your question is what is important for the future, that each and everybody doesn't have to be experiencing death to feel the light. <laughs> the fact that we are born and that we picked our parents and uh, decided a lifetime to celebrate life and boost the planet is fantastic. It's a gift. And so I hope that more and more people realize this on a daily basis can celebrate this for five minutes or 60 seconds or yeah, maybe 30 seconds before they get out of bed and share that with their immediate people in their life. It could be family, it could be kids, but it could be friends, whoever are the three closest people. This will raise the vibration to such a positive level yeah, that the rest will unfold. And then the things feel natural. Like for me, it feels natural to go on my knees and talk to a child. Yeah, because I don't want to look up like this when I'm in that position. Other people look at me and say, why is he doing that? So if people celebrate the fact of being alive and being perfect the way they are as a, as a modus operandi, then, the, then more things like talking with children instead of talking to children feel the most natural. Yeah? We spoke earlier about uh, religion a little bit, and um, I want to get into what you just addressed with the vibration and see if you have any more thoughts or feelings about it. I, I, I've experienced this many times over the years. Um, when you're, well, it doesn't matter what religion or what church you're in, if you have, you know, uh, 20, 50, 100, a couple thousand people all praying the same prayer or thinking on the same thought or meditating on the same thing. There's a, a form of a vibration, unified collective intelligence, minds coming together, focused on the same mm -hmm. vision or goal. Uh, and whether it's religion or network marketing or business or meditation, what, whatever you box it into, whatever you put it into, but if you unify those minds and that thoughts and that, that voice towards that, there is a vibration and a super strong energy that moves naturally. It's a universal law that will move us more in that direction. Um, so I love that you, you touched upon that because I totally believe it, even though I'm not religious, uh, because I, I know there's a lot to that uh, wh and whether you call it another form of spirituality or another form of a, a, a law of attraction or a universal law um, do you have any more you'd like to say about that or your thoughts or feelings on, on this vibration that maybe could give us some tips or tricks to, to get more in that direction or to unify us with some positive outcomes for the future i think we should just consider treating religions like an app on our smartphone Yes, yeah, so and that's great. Celebrate the wide range of their existence, <laughs> and you have a choice. And so, uh, I'm I believe religions are great because, as an example, my mother loved to spend an hour in a in a place where she felt good and praying the rosary. It put her into a nice mindset. It was a grounding experience. And yes, you can have similar experiences applying different methods, but for her, it was a rosary experience. It was her. Roman Catholic perspective. And that is perfect for her. So people should have apps, like they have apps on their mobile phones. They can download ample of those. And if you want to do this, then do this. And if you want to do this, follow the other one. So there should be openness and tolerance. And this is like the current Pope of the Catholic Church is celebrating that. I experienced great things in the largest Muslim country in Indonesia when I lived there for two years. Um, it, it's, it's beautiful to celebrate the diversity and like a rainbow, there are different segments of the color and they can all happily coexist. And that's the core. And if we on top of that, on top of all the apps, except, except the fact there is enough food. <laughs> yeah, there's no reason to be full of fear and, and uh, 
make people fearful. Yeah, so why are you afraid of death if this is the only guaranteed factor of life? Yeah, we have, we have managed to convince billions of people to be afraid of death while it's the only thing which is sure. Yeah, we all die. So, but if you, if you think that's true, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And I believe that like a rainbow concept and like a mobile phone, religions and, and this belief systems which trigger positive experiences, you have that if you're a musician, you're on stage with a thousand people in the audience. Yes, those energies exist and they're beautiful. They're great to move uh, mankind to a uh, higher vibration, absolutely essential. And so uh, you have that in nature. Yeah, you can have it by yourself. You can have it with a thousand people. These models coexist. I have it a lot when I go swimming in the ocean. It doesn't happen when I go swimming in the pool. It actually happens when I'm in the ocean. The salt water is everything around me and this feels different. It has that effect on me. So it, it exists for different people in different setups. The important thing is to take the fear factor out because that is what makes people that often aggressive and try to say this is better than the other and celebrate their coexistence. Yeah, so people don't say, look at a rainbow, take a photo. They don't try to split the colors off. Nobody does that. No part of the world I found where people look at the rainbow, they say, oh, it should be only this or only that. No, they celebrate the existence of the rainbow and that's it. They don't go into the into the uh, separation of color or the argument about it. You might have already answered this in a different way. Uh, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I think right now it already works for everyone. Because as I said, we have not killed each other on an industrial scale in Europe. Um, that's better. Yeah, we can travel around the world more than we ever could before in a peaceful manner. Yeah, and so there are so many things which, which we can achieve today, which are, I think, amazing. And uh, if we start celebrating the things we have, then the other ones will naturally unfold. Yeah, so I believe it's great the way how it is. And uh, accepting who we are is the number one issue. So I believe everybody loving themselves is the core factor to, to uh, make it even better. But I believe that the world we have right now is a great world to live in, and it's, I'm grateful for the fact of being alive. It, it is. It, it is beautiful. Um, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, as you know, and that's why I'm on the Monibu board with you. Um, how, how do you feel we're doing with the sustainable development goals? And are, are you um, convinced and excited about the uh, potential that they have to get us to a better future by December 2030? It is already getting us to a better future on every, every, every day in which we make that a subject to talk about and educate our children that they realize packaging is uh, questionable. You don't need packaging for everything. So the, the current awareness is changing the scenario. People realize they don't need blueberries 12 months per year. <laughs> yeah. Why do you have to grow so many blueberries in Peru and change the ecosystem over there and, and the setup of nature. So for a situation where people need everything all year round, it's, it's cuckoo. Yeah, so this is happening right now, I believe. And um, it should, it's, it's, it's circularity is the most normal thing. If you put your litter next door in front of the neighbor, he will put it somewhere else, it doesn't disappear. Yeah, so circularity is the way how we operate. If we drink, we sweat. So it's, it's a circular process. Yeah, so that is core to be part of our day-to-day -day life and uh, bring it real awareness. If you dump something somewhere, it's in front of somebody else. Yeah, and if you create an issue, it doesn't disintegrate by itself. And so what you have behind you is a map. It doesn't matter where you export it to, it's still hanging out there and considering Mother Earth as one being, as I said before, if you chop off the toe uh, and you don't address it, she will still die. She could be smiling for a certain time, but it will have an infection and will trigger issues. You will see will continue bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. So and we have not looked at it from a holistic perspective for a long time, but this is changing. And a, a generation of people who do not consider country codes, who speak to their friends wherever they are on the planet, uh, are exactly uh, are the change agents which, which makes the difference right now. And uh, they don't care about borders, about any of the stuff which we artificially create. And uh, we are lucky that uh, this is gaining momentum. And as I said, people celebrate the rainbow any part of the world. 
I have uh, just three or two last uh, questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, they're more sustainable takeaways for my guests and, and mainly the young innovators, entrepreneurs, even the youth. Um, what should young innovators in your field or in your areas um, be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make real impact? What are some advice or things that you can give them for their journey? I think the core thing is to make sure it's actually their journey. Yeah, so what I see with several of them, they still follow, follow models. Um, people call themselves serial entrepreneur and this kind of stuff. So uh, it's, there's so many, there's still a whole, so many stereotypes in the generation, uh, which are late teenagers up to their late twenties. Um, so what I feel when I listen to some of them, that there's still a majority of them who follow stereotypes and follow models, which are motivated by stuff, which they are fed through media, through uh, social circles, which very, in a few cases only, it feels authentic as being their driver. Yeah, so that's probably, I think, the number one issue. Make sure it's yours and spend time somewhere by yourself, listening only to yourself. And if you do this for six weeks and still, this still is what really resonates with you, do it. Yeah, right. but otherwise, if it's something because somebody told you it gets you to this or to that, yeah, it's, it's all this, this is the, the hot air perspective or the stereotype perspective is over and about 50% at this stage. So we, we've both been around the block a while on this planet and have uh, created some beautiful families, have a lot longer to go and we're gonna have a wonderful journey, but is there anything that you could depart to our listeners that you say, boy, I wish I would have known that from the start or I, I wish I would have learned this one thing early on because it would have made my journey a little bit easier or or better yeah i think the number one issue is to to uh cross the cross the human design borders yeah so i believe part of secondary school if we look at current education terminologies should be they just spend uh, one year some so two years one year in, in one place one year in another place with multiple religions cultures upbringing diversity I think that's that's the number one most powerful thing. Yeah, so uh, I only experienced that in my, or I experienced by crossing the borders in the Netherlands. The fact of me actually being in Hong Kong and places like this was uh, uh, in my late teens, early 20s for longer periods of time. And But this should happen at an earlier stage. Yeah, so being able to experience that, I believe is, is the number one most powerful thing to, to uh, for a better life and to raise the well-being of mothers. So, because we are only limited to ears, to elbows, to shoulders, to kneecaps, whatever you, if you compare with the human body, and that just doesn't do it. Yeah. yeah. And people, people will fight with you and say, this is the best ear, Boof, because we are sitting in Norway, or we are sitting yeah, yeah. in Hong Kong, or we are sitting in Sydney, and this is the best kneecap, whatever you want to call it. And it's, logically, it's a nice angle, but the lampshade is here. It's not here, it's not over there, it's here. And the guys who tell you this are very stuck in their lampshades, yeah, and, which is understandable. But uh, you will change this only by changing it, by making it a uh, given experience that in secondary school age, you have two years, 12 months in this part of the world, 12 months in that part of the world. We will spend so much less afterwards on um, defense budgets. Yeah, on, on border control issues and who builds which fence. Yeah, that's that will happen, but you need that experience first. Yeah, the, the, the money that we're stealing from each other for defense budgets and for border controls is it's just stealing it from our, ourselves. We could have a much better life and have more basic quality of life if we didn't uh, spend all that time fighting against and separating each other. Um, to, to end all this up, um, I'm, I'm 
pretty much done, but do you have any questions for me or is there anything that you would like to add before we say goodbye? Any words of wisdoms or things that you would like the listeners to know before I wish you well? No, our path has crossed a lot and it will probably continue to do so. And uh, I believe we covered many subjects and I'm looking forward to seeing how the audio works today. And uh, otherwise we do it for a third time. So no problem. Uh, enjoy it, enjoy work. putting this together. And it's a wonderful experience of a digital empower 2020. And I think it's important to do more of those because this is actually where knowledge gets transferred. I remember that my oldest sons at a certain part uh, when they were really young, I, had a, I made it mandatory that they watch one or two TED Talks. They could pick which one. And uh, they listened one or two TED Talks and then gave a summary one evening during dinner. And uh, this, they got so excited about it because this was so much more interesting than listening to people at school. Yeah, uh, but we're talking now about something which is 10 years ago, 10 years ago. So, um, so what we're doing today is, is a similar way of sharing perspective. And this kind of content is absolutely essential and needs to be found. And so people look at rainbows differently probably after listening to our dialogue right now. And they might actually look into the last thousand years of European borders and start smiling about it. Yeah, so then you know, next time you do a border crossing or somebody says, well, wow, you are from so and so and so and so, they have a different, uh, more humorous way to relate to it. I love it. Thanks so much, Andreas. Uh, so good to see you and please take care and, and uh, oh, you squeeze those wonderful kids and family of yours and tell them all hi. Thanks. I will. Thank you. you. Enjoy having okay. Nice talking to you. Thank you.